All right, boils and ghouls. I don't know. Japanese horror kind of gives me like this sort of vibe, color-wise, like a, a lot of blues and stuff. So I'm going with this chill blue. One Miss Call is a movie I don't watch often, but every time I rewatch it, I realize I like it a lot better than the last time that I watched it. Now, I just rewatched this last night. I was kind of like falling asleep near the last act, but I, I've seen the movie a few times. Then I was lucky, just so lucky, to wake up to watching the remake from 2008 with Shannon Sussman, which she's the only thing that saves that remake at all from any type of watchability. This original here, if you haven't seen the original One Miss Call by Takashi Miike, which, speaking of Miike, I think this is only the second time I've talked to him on the channel. I know I did something for Audition, podcast episode maybe. So he's not a director I've seen like a ton of his movies. I've seen maybe a handful like, but every one that I've seen is either a near masterpiece or a masterpiece. <laughs> like Audition, Ichi the Killer, 13, Assa uh, 13 Assassins is one I saw a little more recently. That movie is fantastic. If you haven't seen 13 Assassins by Takashi Miike, check that film out. And then pretty much this other movie, One Miss Call, which even among Miike fans who I've talked to, like people that are big into his work. They don't even list this movie too high up in his filmography. I don't know why. Maybe it's just because all his other movies are that great. Because I've always, like I said, enjoyed this. And then every time I revisit it, it gets better. There's some creepy-ass imagery in this movie, which the remake is completely devoid of. <laughs> all of it. All the really clever touches that Mike threw into this film are missing from the remake. Like, that's probably the worst remake of a Japanese horror movie. When we got flooded with them after the Ring American remake, and we just got J horror after J horror remakes. One Miss Call, I think, is the worst, and I think that's the reason we stopped <laughs> getting so many of them. But the next year, then we had Paranormal Activity, and that blew up and became the new thing. But can't help thinking One Miss Call 2008 helped destroy that whole J-horror remake era that we were in. Now this, like many of the Japanese horror classics we got in the 90s, early 2000s, was based off a novel. Fuck if I know, like with all the Japanese horror I've covered on this channel so far, I don't do Japanese, I don't attempt it, unless it's, <laughs> it's a name I know how to pronounce. So this movie stars, like usual, a bunch of Japanese people. And they all do a great job. Like, this not a bad performance in this movie. Now, if you haven't seen One Miss Call, or you just saw the remake back in the day when it came out, and you have no idea, remember anything about it, this psychology student, Yumi, has one of her friends receive a missed call. And she ends up listening to the voice message, and it's dated two days ahead of, you know, in the future of what today is. And she hears her exact voice, uh, then her scream, and that's it. And basically, her friend started dying after receiving this phone call, this one missed call, and listening to the voice message that is like a preview of exactly how they're going to die. It's a very intriguing premise, just like with Ringu, just like with Ju on the Grudge. Like a lot of the Japanese horror movies we got around this time had really interesting premises, and a lot of them focused on technology. Pulse is another one that's a great film. I can't wait. I'll, I'll do that one soon for sure. That one is a favorite of mine for Japanese horror, which, even though this one gets mentioned like a lot, with top Japanese horror films. I don't know if I would put this in like a top 15, 20 even of mine, but it's definitely effective. And it definitely, even though it has a lot of cliches by this point, like 2003, it was a lot of stuff in this film we've seen already in previous Japanese horror films. So it was kind of outstaying its welcome. It didn't really do 
many things new, but just having Takashi Miike's, you know, vision here and having him direct and his choices of how to shoot things and especially just his his excess. <laughs> the guy always takes things to the extreme and just shoves things in your face. And it works, for the most part, to the benefit of the film, just having Mike here being the director. But I still wouldn't hold this up as like a excellent film or anything like that. But it is fun. Oh, and even Shannon Sosa didn't want to talk about the remake. I met her uh, in Jersey for the Horicon. Talked to her for a few minutes. Still gorgeous. I brought it up, and she said, I, "I don't really like talking about." That. <laughs> so no one likes talking about that remake. One thing already I love about this movie, and I love about a lot of Japanese horror, the originals, the Japanese ones. Quick credits, like right into the film. There's no two-minute credits or anything. I mean, don't get me wrong. There are some credits, opening sequences for movies that I. I absolutely love but most of the time it's i just want to get into the movie and that's how a lot of japanese films are they just show the producer a few people who star in the film the director the name of the movie and then boom we're right into the film and this is about an hour and 52 minute film which is pretty much the usual length for japanese horror around this time which actually brings us to our first tangent to, <laughs> which actually brings us to our first tangent of the video I've always wondered this. Somebody who might know an answer, or if you live more so Asia or India or something like that, let me know. Because the average film length for foreign films seem to be a lot longer on average compared to the 90 minutes that we usually get as an average here in America. The thing I've always attributed that to is that it's maybe more of an event like in those countries like you go out on a certain night or whatever to go see a movie you're going to see a film and you make all the night out of it so they don't mind it being as long two hours two and a half hours whereas us greedy and lack of attention ridden stupid americans <laughs> we can't barely get through 90 minutes and we're so oversaturated with films is that a reason like <laughs> it's nothing to do with anything like usual but Figure somebody might know an answer. So back to the movie. We got Yumi, the main character, and her friend Yoko. And they're hanging out. And then Yoko receives a phone call that she misses. Which, could this ghost just, tangent number two. Can the ghost just, like, end a call whenever it wants? Because if they go to pick it up, they miss the call every time. In this and in the remake. It's not like they can go and answer it. So it just rings, I guess, for dramatic effect <laughs> until they go to look at the phone, and then it just goes to voicemail. But the the creepy ringtone, which is played on like a music box or something for this, it is so much better than the stupid, horrendously bad <laughs> ringtone they use in the remake. This is going to probably turn into a comparison of the remake and the original film, even though we're like 10 minutes in or so and nobody's going to know it <laughs> until now. That's pretty much what I'm going to do, especially because it's so fresh in my head that I just happen to have the luck of watching it again. But like, this is a creepy ass ringtone. That's effective. And like I said, in the remake, it's like just like a generic, <laughs> like dial tone sound, but it is a little eerie, but it's, it's lacking everything that this has in this film. So just for that, the sound design on that music box, for the ringtone alone, this film is instantly a million times better when it comes to the sound design compared to the remake and it should be no goddamn surprise it's Takashi Miike and you bet your ass is probably a cover coming soon a little one of this ringtone from one Miss call that was actually a good unintentional segue into the sound design of this movie this is another thing that a lot of Japanese horror classics just excel at as well as how they shoot ghosts 
Like, the Japanese just have some knack for shooting ghost sequences. You see this in so many of their movies, and this is why a, a large amount of Japanese horror is supernatural and ghost-related. They excel at that. The sound design is the same thing, and that's what the remake, just another thing that it lacks here in this opening scene. They're just like at a party, in the remake, when the friend gets the call here, the equivalent of Yoko, and then she hears her last words in two days, and then we find out when we get the gray scene here, when she gets thrown over the overpass onto the train, and her arm and leg are severed from her body, but yet she's still able to make a phone call to the next person that the curse basically gets passed on to. All of that is missing in the remake, like, She's, she doesn't miss. She doesn't lose her limbs. That's one thing, and that's a clever, clever little detail in this movie that I really like. That after that whole train sequence, she it's her severed arm that's dialing the next number. That's unique, and it's just stripped away <laughs> completely in the remake. And even that, the way that whole train sequence is still a train in the remake. The way it's done there is terrible, too, just in every way compared to the original. But the sound design, when they're listening to the voicemail here, they're in a bathroom, and you hear the water running in the background, and it's like a little bit of white noise, and it's excellent. Like, it's really eerie, and it really sets the atmosphere. And again, in the remake, they're just at a party with music blasting in the background. Like, it's devoid of any type of atmosphere or foreboding, eerie feeling that grows throughout it. This movie excels at the feel. Like, if there's anything that I could say and praise the most of this movie, it's the eerie atmosphere throughout it. Another thing I say all the time, tangent, whatever, <laughs> about these types of movies foreign films maybe not as much italian maybe just because i'm i'm super into that genre so i'm used to it but asian horror especially like indonesian horror thailand uh, india like horror from all those countries as well as japan china hong kong it goes on i think because those cultures are very very foreign to American culture, or like Canadian culture, or even you know European culture, it's a very different culturally, like in every single way. The cultural barrier is very, very, very wide <laughs> for Asian culture versus you know Western culture. So I think a lot of these foreign films benefit from that because we are afraid of what we what we don't know, of what we don't understand, what is foreign to us. And these films are literally very foreign to us. So I feel like that they always benefit from that aspect as well. Like, it goes back to what I said about how they excel at shooting ghost sequences and shots of ghosts in their movies. Like, the infamous shot of Sadako with her, the close-up on her eye, the shots in Jew on the Grudge, like, there's so many. I mentioned Pulse with the creepy-ass sequence. What a great sequence that is. I gotta do a video on that movie soon. That's, that's coming this week, probably. But even the way that they film those sequences is very different from the majority of what we see in ghost films here in America or in Western culture. Especially in the mainstream, when you look at the Conjuring film, Annabelle, and that whole Conjuring verse, and all ghost films that have come out in the last 20 years or so, it's very different. So when you see these movies, and the way that these directors in Japan shoot their ghosts, and just the makeup on them, the sound design, the uh, common use of reversing their walking, so that they'll be walking backwards, and then they reverse the tape to make them creepily walk forwards. You see this in a lot of Japanese horror, and I think it makes it that much more effective, because we're not used to seeing it as much, like anywhere near as much, to how they do it in these films. Uh, then there's a detective... Fuck if I remember his name. Similar character in the remake. 
just a, a very drab performance <laughs> in that one. This one does all right. And he had a similar experience with his sister that died under the same circumstances that she got a call, got a voicemail from, you know, days ahead of time. And she ended up having a jawbreaker candy in her mouth when he went to identify the body, which is something we see pretty much after every death in this film. And we get an explanation for what it means when we start understanding exactly what this curse is and who's causing it. Now, I usually say whenever this subject comes up, social commentary and horror, I really don't give a fuck unless like it's a movie that it really heavily relies on that social commentary. I mean, Get Out is a good example that comes to mind immediately. That's one of them. I mean, Romero films definitely, we know, have a lot of social commentary in them. I'm just looking at zombies ripping people apart. But I do respect it. Obviously, we have some social commentary in this movie, like... Again, a lot of the Japanese horror at the time of obsession with technology or the dangers of technology. But we also have abuse in this movie. There's a whole class that uh, Yuki, that's the name, right? Yumi, that's it. That Yumi, they all have Ys. (laughs) All the girls in this movie, their names start with a Y. Yumi is a psychology major. And there's a whole scene talking about abuse and she even gets called out by the professor because she's distracted on her phone and says what's this lecture about she says how abuse spawns more abuse and then we find out later on in the film that she had an abusive mother and abuse also plays into the ghost that's causing all these people to die so again is it something i pay attention to heavily when watching this movie not really i'm aware it's there 100 percent i think they do a decent job like implementing it even though when we get near the end i have a lot of issues (laughs) with the explanation of why all this is happening so it only goes so much with me that whole social commentary on the abuse because then the whole backstory we get of what's her name Mimiko and I forget the other one I'm lucky I even remember that one their whole story I have a lot of issues with but we'll get there then we get one of my favorite scenes in this movie the first kill with the friend of Yumi when she's walking on the overpass above the train coming and she notices I mean this is another thing if you heard your last words in a voicemail in your own voice from a day or two in the future, leading up to your death screen, those would be words that I would consciously keep out of my mind and my mouth at all costs. So the fact that they say these same things that they know are the, the last words <laughs> that they're ever going to speak, I don't know about any of that. I mean, sure, it happens... I feel like I'd be paying a lot closer attention to the words that I speak (laughs) just to maybe alter my fate in some way. But unfortunately, she doesn't, and she gets tossed over the railing and onto the train. And like I mentioned earlier, her the arm being severed from her body but still making the next phone call. I mean, (laughs) amazing decision, which again is gutted from the remake. I mean, I can't not go on on this a little more. The words that are her last words that she heard in that original voicemail is, oh no, it's raining. So rain would immediately be on my mind at all times, especially knowing that the time of that voicemail is minutes away. So even if I saw a drop of rain, I would be running in terror. But yet she just utters the same words that she knows are her last words. Oh, it, it doesn't matter really. It's shot really, really well. It's again the the atmosphere and how eerie it's shot, and some of the effects. I mean. We see this a little more later on with 
kind of like, I don't know how to describe it, like a shaky cam, but it's not, but it's just to make it look more ghostly, especially when we actually see, like, the ghost. I don't know how to describe it, but if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. It's kind of like a weird digital quick effect. It doesn't really hold up too well, but it's so much better than, let's get back to the remake for a bit. First of all, Shannon Soseman's character, who is Yumi in the remake, she is at every death of every character. <laughs> I mean, this first scene works so well because Yumi isn't there. She's on the phone with Yuki. I'm hoping it's Yuki still, but whatever. They're on the phone. So she has to hear her repeat these words that was on that voicemail and then hear her die in real, in real life. So it works on a much better level. The fact that they're not together than in the remake when Shannon Soseman is trying to run there and I'll be there in a minute and she gets there just just in time to see her friend get you know, mauled by this train. It holds your hand so much. I mean, which is something that's expected with American remakes of foreign films. But it really holds your hand like throughout that entire remake. And all the hallucinations that they have, it's only in the remake. As far as I can remember from last night, <laughs> that you don't see any of that in here. When the main characters, after they get the phone call... They start seeing these bad CGI <laughs> hallucinations. Like people with the cover of the remake. It has like three mouths. You see someone with a face like that. You see another bad CGI image and stuff that they're hallucinating. None of that is in the original here. And I am so fucking thankful for that. Because it looks terrible. I was like, oh my god, really? Like this did not hold up at all. Like, on not even a comical level, it just looks awful. So glad they didn't do any of that in the original here, because that's how they thought that they'd make it scary with the remake, is by throwing some creepy faces in there, and that's not why this film is effective. Like I've said, it's the atmosphere and just the eerie and foreboding feel that creeps along as this film progresses. They knew that they couldn't match that <laughs> with the remake. So they said, let's just throw in all these ugly CGI creatures. So then her friend Kenji is the next victim. And he starts believing the story that Yumi's telling him. But then near the end, and this is just like a few minutes before the time that this guy's supposed to croak <laughs> from this ghost. So he starts obviously getting very afraid. But his defense is that he thinks they're playing a prank on him. And I mean, I don't blame him, but I mean, Yuki just died. I mean, it doesn't sound like a suicide at all, even though that's what the police deem it. So Kenji ends up walking away, and then we get a great suspenseful scene here with great sound design, very eerie, of the elevator opening. And then him looking inside it, and then he just gets pulled into the elevator shaft. Falls to the bottom, uh, then the candy comes out of his mouth again. It looks like a jawbreaker. Like, you know, the hard candy. <laughs> That's what it looks like. And it oozes out of his mouth, and he proceeds to make a phone call, which I'm pretty sure, if I recall correctly, is a minute after their deaths. Like, once these people die from this curse, a minute later, their dead bodies make the phone call to the next victim. And it's whoever, it could be anybody in their phone contact list. On the remake side of it, for that scene, or the similar scene, it's terrible. <laughs> I mean, I know I keep saying, the, the remake is that bad, man. Like, this is like a half praise a film video, and half just shit on the remake of it. I couldn't do this for Ringu 
and The Ring, because, I mean, Ringu is in my top films of all time, but I loved the remake also. So I couldn't have that contrast here. These movies work perfectly for this. But you got some guy friend who like was into the Yuki equivalent in the original here, and he storms out, and again, Shannon Sulsiman chases after him. She's there. I mean, Yumi is here for this death, for, uh, forgot his name already, Uchi. <laughs> I'm sure it's something like that. And it's it's something like right at a final destination. The guy just gets up and there's like an explosion on like a work site behind him and a pole impales through his chest right in front of Shannon Sosaman and it's so final destination. And it looks terrible. Again, the effects of the CGI in that movie are atrocious. Luckily, the scene in the original here with Kenji, that's his name, infinitely better. Again, how does this shit just not creep you out? Come on now. If that was the ringtone I was hearing off of my phone while going through all this, I'd probably just have a heart attack and die and just be free game for the ghost to just come do whatever it wants with me. Because that is terrifying. For context, for people who haven't seen either, this is the ringtone from the remake. It's fucking awful, <laughs> is my point. A little creepy, but it's so generic sounding. I mean, that's so much better as a composition. So the detective, whose sister also succumbed to this, I think it was a drowning, right? Because in the very beginning, we get two awesome shots that the characters are discussing somebody that they heard that died to, you know, from this curse. And... They mention a drowning, and uh, then you see this creepy shot of the person's like face. Uh, then you see an even close-up shot that it's still blurry, but it, very effective. So I forget if that's his sister, or if that's just somebody else who died from the curse. Somebody correct me if they know in the comments. The detective and her end up trying to figure out the link between all of this, and this is where it gets very cliched that pretty much identical to The Ring <laughs> and and many other horror movies around this time where there has to be some investigation between two people that found each other because of this whole predicament and it leads them to a location and, then, and that's exactly what happens here. It's not many twists and turns and they end up finding this hospital and this is something that differs from the remake also. Lest I forget hearing it the first time after Yuki's death with the train. But I'm pretty sure uh, Yumi only says it here. And has it been Yoko instead of Yuki this whole time? <laughs> it's been Yoko this whole time instead of Yuki. Whatever. The Y one. The train woman. <laughs> she took the Y train out of you. But whatever. Yoko. Didn't happen for that kill. But Yumi ends up telling the detective that Right after uh, Kenji, or Kenshi, whatever. I told you, this is why I don't do Japanese shit often. She says that she heard the sound of an, of an inhaler. But in the remake, Shannon Sosaman says that she heard the asthma, you know, the inhaler spray after the train death of Yoko's character and Kenji's character. So there's, let me say this, even though... I've been mentioning a lot of differences between the remake and the original. There are almost all technical aspects of the film, like the way it was made, shot, the atmosphere, all that, the performances, the sound design. For the remake, 
like story wise, it follows pretty much the story beat for beat. There are a little bit of differences, but mostly all the characters are based off the original characters here in the movie. Almost all the same scenes happen, to some to a lesser extent. So it follows it very faithfully. Yeah, it's hard to follow up and remake a film by Takashi Miike. Like I said, I'm not the most familiar on Miike's entire filmography, but even this being a lesser film of his, it's hard to follow that up. Yeah, with a remake by whoever the hell directed that remake which I'm pretty sure was fired from film or only limited to filming like State Farm commercials. After the two deaths in both respective films, same thing, Yumi slash Shannon are with a friend and they take the batteries out of the phone, but yet the phone still rings and not Sumi in the original. She gets approached after getting her phone call of... I don't know, it's like a, a TV show where they say they can help her, that they can exercise her, and they do the same thing in the remake. And that's probably the only other thing that saves the remake for me besides uh, Shannon Soseman is Ray Wise, which you put him in anything and he will most likely save it for me. He saves Jeepers Creepers too, like 100% for me. That movie I would never watch. If it wasn't for one or two other scenes and Ray Wise. So, you got Ray Wise in the remake. That's the only other reason to even check that movie out if you have it. But just like the difference between how those two scenes are shot, it's staggering the difference in quality. Natsumi is on the show, and it's shot so stylish. And the way, again, with the ghost when Mimiko's hand reaches behind whatever it is a door uh, then her face slowly creeps out I thought it was a really cool detail kind of switching things up from how it usually is that usually in films technology like cameras videotape doesn't pick up ghosts but you'll see it you know in front of you in real life here Yumi shows up at the studio and she can't see what Natsumi, right, <laughs> is seeing in front of her. But when she looks at the monitor, she's able to see it. So I thought that was a cool little switcheroo that you don't see too often. The Natsumi equivalent in the remake, it's another, like, bit. first of all, the terrible CGI images and hallucinations she's having, again, look just awful. And then it's another, like, Final Destination-esque type death. Natsumi's death in the original. This is where Takashi Miike's love of excess really shines in this movie. This bitch doesn't... She don't just kill over and die. <laughs> it's not like the ring or Ringu when, you know, it's just a freeze frame on their face or they have the look of fear frozen on their dead corpse. No, this woman's arms and the sound design here is excellent too. With the bones breaking, her arms being bent in ways it shouldn't. Then her head is being twisted around and her head ends up falling off right in the front of the frame and in the background you see your body walking standing for a few seconds and then falls over the lighting's excellent we got some red and blue lighting in there <laughs> Her whole kill scene, that's another one of the best scenes in this movie. The train scene, this scene, and one other scene near the end. So, getting into the third act here is when they go to the hospital, and in the remake, it's like a burnt-down hospital. This, I think, is just abandoned or something. doesn't matter. They end up going, the detective and Yumi, and she remembers that sound of the inhaler going off before Kenji's death. And they look up the records there, and they find, find this girl named Miko, 
who was coming in for asthma attacks. And every time she had an asthma attack, her younger sister, Nanako, was hurt in some way, either cut or... And they thought it was the mother, Marie, of these two daughters that was hurting her younger daughter, Nanako. And we get the reveal near the end of the movie that it was actually the older sister, Mamiko, who was hurting her younger sister. And her younger sister basically let her to an extent because she would give her candy. And that's where the whole jawbreaker, hard candy thing comes into play with this whole story. Again, like, I have issues with this. I feel like they should have just kept it a lot more ambiguous, kept it a lot more vague, maybe not even given an explanation. But this is one thing that a lot of Japanese horror and Asian horror, for the most part, throws into a lot of their movies, their horror films. There's always an aspect or a B-plot, or maybe it's just the entire plot, that focuses on family. You see this in almost every Japanese horror film that I can think of, like off the top of my head, is just the very, very big emphasis on family. And you see that in this film, and I feel like that's maybe why they had to make that whole backstory up. Now, this is based off of a novel, like I said, so I don't know how much of it is from the novel. I'm sure this is part of the novel. I feel like for the movie, though, it would have benefited to leave it more ambiguous and never really find out exactly why this ghost is doing this and that this curse exists and just leave it a lot more of a mystery. But for what it is, it's not bad. But we have another great scene in, I think, I forget where the location, the next location they go to. And this is the third, like, best favorite scene of mine in this movie. When we see the ghost of Mamiko starting to you know, really hardcore haunt Yumi. And the detective's, like, on his way, trying to get to her in time. And on her phone, her phone, like, like a text message, kind of, but it says, like, you have 56 seconds to live. And she's freaking out. And then we see the ghost of Mimiko, and then it turns into her abusive mother. <laughs> and she has this, like, weird type of embrace you know, as much as you can with the hideous ghost and that turned into your mother and then turns right back into Miko and then the detective gets there, supposedly saves her. So then the detective ends up seeing a tape, like a surveillance tape or a nanny cam, whatever the mom had, I guess. And we, he gets the realization that it was Mamiko hurting her younger sister it wasn't Marie the mother and this leads him to racing over to Yumi's house where we get more just excellent weird eerie scary imagery of Mimiko's ghost appearing to Yumi and when the detective gets there she seems fine and then he gives her a hug I'm so happy you're all right all that shit and he sees blood dripping on the floor and realizes he's been stabbed by her and as he collapses to the ground great shots when he looks in the mirror and he sees Mamiko in the mirror even though it's Yumi that Mamiko has now taken over Oh, that's right. And Mamiko died not from an asthma attack, which was what was like on the official hospital records, but the mother came home and caught her harming her sister, Nanako. And she started choking on one of the hard candies, which is another reason why this plays into the whole story, the candy. <laughs> And her mom just let her die. 
just let her choke to death, and she left with Nanako, the younger sister, who is still alive. So for this ending, I think the ending's fucking dumb for this movie. I'm sorry. They could have thought of something better. Again, I don't know how faithful to the novel it is, but after getting stabbed by Yumi or Mimiko, he ends up waking up in the hospital. Uh, then we see Yumi who's possessed by Mimiko. This is like her new vessel, I guess. And she has a knife behind her, implying that she plans to hurt him <laughs> in some way. But then she, like, feeds him one of the hard candies. And then it ends. So I've always interpreted this as this is now Mimiko in Yumi's body. And this detective is now her new little sister, Nanako, that she can harm like whenever she wants, and but she'll still give candy to? Is that what it's supposed to be? Because that's stupid. I've never cared for the ending to this movie. I get where they, what they were trying to do. I get how they're trying to wrap everything together. I mean, but the detective, he's just going to let, like, willingly let Yumi, a.k.a. Mimiko, torture him, stab him, cut him and stuff whenever she pleases, and he's just going to accept candy and be happy. I don't know, unless she just controls him completely now, mentally, and his, all his behavior and everything is under her control. I don't know. They don't explain it. There are sequels to this. If I saw them, I don't remember a goddamn thing. And I don't remember enjoying them either if I did see them, but I... I don't think I did. If anybody has seen One Miss Call 2, and there's a third one, right, called One Miss Call Final, let me know if they're worth watching. Like, they're definitely not getting videos anytime soon. But if they're worth checking out, maybe even just the second one or one of them, let me know if you've seen them in the comments, and I'll definitely look into them if I hear good things. But the ending of the remake pretty much the same thing. You get the same explanation and the whole same family backstory with the same respective characters. It's a little different in the end, but honestly, I, I, I don't even remember it. it it's, it's terrible in every way. <laughs> even for the ending of the original here that I said I don't care for much, it's worse. It, it's just some s stupid stuff happens, some bad CGI, and then basically the same type of ending with him getting stabbed, and then Mamiko, whatever the hell the ghost is in the remake, taking over Shannon Sullivan. So, like, same exact thing. So that's one missed call, 2003, and the remake from 2008. This is a little two for Tuesday. But the difference between the two is is staggering. Like, I don't know how to put it into words. This isn't a perfect analogy, because this one I'm about to say is the same director doing both films. But... It kind of reminds me of the insane quality gap of Ringu 2 and the American The Ring 2, which were both directed by Hideo Nakata, who did the original The Ring. It had to be heavy studio meddling with the American remake of The Ring 2, because those movies, too, follow pretty much the same story. Like, it's pretty faithful, the remake. But the difference, and like I said, not a perfect you know, analogy because 
this is obviously Takashi Miike and somebody doing State Farm commercials. <laughs> but it does remind me of that. Just that's how big of a gap there is in everything to do with these these films. So this was fun going back and doing these two ones. It's been a while, like I said, since I've done a Japanese horror film. Maybe I'll do uh, Jew on the Grudge, which honestly, for the poll, this movie blew that one away. And I said, I know which one was going to win. I was referring to the Grudge. <laughs> like, I thought the Grudge was going to absolutely win that poll. So I was very happy that it didn't, even though I love that film too. But the next movie has got to be the third Ginger Snaps film, the prequel i don't remember the name for it we just hit the two-year anniversary of the channel it was like yesterday or today or something like that so thank you everybody just for your love your support your friendships just your collaborations your discussions your comments everything it means more to me than you'll ever know but my first video on the channel was chosen at random and it was ginger snaps and for the year anniversary of the channel, I went back and did Ginger Snaps 2. So it's only fitting for the second year anniversary to do and finish up that series. So it only took two years to finish up a trilogy. I don't remember that movie at all. All I know is that Emily Perkins and Catherine Isabel are both great in it, like in the first two films. So, all right, guys. Hope everyone's having a great morning, afternoon, or night. I will talk to you all soon. Take care, boils and ghouls.